Thank you all for joining us today. As Chris said, I'm the Orchid Historical Society side of this team, um, and it is definitely a team effort. Um, before I get into the introduction of the speakers and the topic, I promised last month I was going to announce the speakers for the fall series. So if you are interested, on September the 17th, we're having Anne Hagedorn, who's the author of Sleeper Agent that deals with the Polonium in the Playhouse. When she was doing research for her new book, Secret Agent, she came across an awful lot of Dayton history, including an Oakwood girlfriend for the spy, and it's not in her book. So she's going to come and share all of that history with us in September. In October, Sarah Crushaw is coming to talk about Dayton ghosts and legends. So it's a perfect topic for October. And in November, um, we're having Ken Survey, and he's going to talk about the orphans that came here to Oakwood during World War II, as well as sharing a lot of the other Oakwood and regional stories of the World War II veterans in honor of Veterans Day. So I think we've got some really good topics this fall as well. So um, I know the library has it on their website in terms of the dates and times and the Historical Society will have theirs soon. So if you've forgotten these dates, you can check them. All right, now this is my absolute pleasure because I've already been telling these women that I'm a gardener. Um, I'm a botanist by official training. And so I am just delighted that this all coincided in, as you see on your buttons, the Native Plant Month. And so the two speakers today, first is Georgie Wissner, who I've known for a while. And Georgie does a great deal of research in addition to everything else she's done in the community. And I think she's got some very interesting things that she's uncovered as she's done research for the pres presentation on some of the gardens in Oakwood. And then Mara Bosch, who is a certified master gardener, for those of you who don't know, it's an extensive program that you go through. I think you, you have to do an internship, don't you, in order to get certified, um, spend a certain number of hours doing the work. And uh, so she's going to be talking to us about some of the trends in gardening now. Um, so if you have plant questions about what can I put in my garden, what's the current thing to do, um, Mara's going to be the one as well as Georgie to ask the questions. So without further ado, welcome Georgie and Mara. Thank you. So this is pretty fun today. Uh, how many of you either already worked in your garden this morning or thought about it? <laughs> good. That's good. I thought about it this morning and thought oh, I could get my nails dirty. That's really so not a problem. Okay, hold on here. Uh, this is a brief tour of some of Dayton's really grandest gardens. These are gardens that um, from a hundred years ago, and I picked gardens that either are no longer there, so you can get a sense of what used to be or gardens where most of the action's in the back of the property and you can't really see it from the street. Now, I gave you a list of the all 18 houses and addresses of the garden tour from 100 years ago. Please don't wander into their yards. I think that could be a huge surprise for some of these people. Uh, but it's interesting to see how they put this together. Dayton had two major landscape architects, the first were the Olmsted brothers and the earliest that I find of their working with Dayton residents was about the end of the 19th century. Um, and they are, they are out of Brookline, Massachusetts, and they're still active today, or more or less. And then Sam Zaring, a Harvard graduate who went first to Detroit and decided that Dayton was a better, had more prospects for him as a landscape architect and moved down here. So, uh, in May of 1928, the Garden Club of Dayton hosted a one-day uh, tour, a series of tours of 18 houses, and 300 women drove up from Cincinnati for the day. It just kind of blows me away. Um, the work that you're going to see, I, Donna was very gracious to give me credit, but most of this work was done by Cindy Garner and Frances Reverger, two members of our Garden Club, uh, who did the work documented all of this, who found these pictures. These are slides uh, that are in the Smithsonian, both out at Wright State and in the Smithsonian's uh, Archives of American Gardens uh, for everybody. They're hand-painted, hand-painted glass slides. They're pretty cool from a hundred years ago. Okay, I don't, oh, oh, I know, no, wait, okay, sorry. 
So let's talk for just a brief minute about the characteristics of classical gardens, much like classical uh, music and classical painting, classical architecture. It's very similar in the sense that it's clearly defined geometry, dramatic focal points, symmetrical details. Um, we'll see a lot of it today, and I'm going to walk you through one of my favorites first. We're going to start with High Acres, which was the home of Fred and Ethel Wright, garden designed by Sam Zering. This property is on the northwest corner of Ridgeway and Dorothy and was originally the Patterson family's summer home. Their winter home was here in Oakwood. The summer home was in Kettering. <laughs> the Wrights of a Wright department store family borrowed the property for several years after the flood in 1913 and then bought it for a dollar plus consideration from the um, Pattersons, tore it down and built a much more formal home. The property had 12 acres and big commanding views looking west out of the back of the house. Now, this is one of the original garden design plans. And let's, let me just make this work and they have to be here. There, oh no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 okay, there, you have to be in front of it, there it is, okay. So I said, I said that it's Ridgeway and Dorothy. We've all been through that intersection a thousand times right before you go over the bridge. I do point out this was 12 acres. And this back here, you hardly ever notice it, but it's still there. There's a cutout road that provided service access all the way around the property to the eight car garage over here on this side. But mostly people went in the main entrance circular driveway, and the house. Now, mentally, divide the map in half, starting right under the H, come straight down, because the property really does divide out in an interesting way. On the left-hand left side, it's mostly recreational, less formal. The uh, swimming pool was here, and you got there through a wildflower garden, and this was left in a much more rustic state. And it was typical of the time because the area around the house was much more tended and planted and formal. And then a series, oh, pardon me, a series of formal laid out gardens came down and led back here to some, uh, these were fruit trees, these, this was a, uh, both a cutting garden and vegetable gardens. There was an outdoor grill back, or fireplace and grill back here. Their greenhouse, sort of the working aspects of a big yard. Now let's be 100% clear. Mrs. Wright did not do this by herself. <laughs> she met every single morning for coffee in her breakfast room with her eight gardeners, or at least some representative of her eight gardeners. I could be a fabulous gardener. She <laughs> was fine. I could be gardener herself. <laughs> okay, so this is the back. Come out the back of the house. You've got the big sweeping garden. She, Mrs. Wright, look, I, I made fun of her, but really she was Dayton's grandest gardener. And these were probably Dayton's grandest gardens. You can just picture sitting on this on this terrace in one of those easy chairs, having a cup of tea, it would be a great time. Country houses of England and America in this period were laid out so that the formal gardens were close to the house and became more and more uncontrolled as you moved away from the house, so that by the time they reached the perimeter of the landscaping, uh, they merged into the surrounding landscape. Seven or eight gardeners helped Mrs. Wright in the maintenance of the gardens. And they, the style was, and continues to be in some places, to create small intimate rooms. In addition to those big sweeping views, you wanted smaller rooms. So this is directly to the left, if you're looking at the house from the front. This is on the left side or south side of the house. And it's a lovely little place for a more intimate conversation. And then you begin down the terraced evergreen path toward the lily pools. 
If you turn left from where we were just standing, guests would take the steps down through the evergreen path and follow a charming cascading water feature, uh, ending in some lily pools at the bottom. All of this is still there. And the water, the cascading water feature was functional when the house was a show house 10, 15 years ago. I can't remember exactly when. The high drooping, I thought this was fascinating. The high drooping and dark trees are meant to suggest Victorian cemeteries with thoughts of life's losses and remedy. Uh, remnants of those plantings are quite clear. And then as you worked your way down to the base, this is a knot garden. This is a rose garden, knot garden. Um, again, the hedges create a sense of room in nature. The Dayton Herald periodically would list which gardens were open for touring, and Mrs. Wright frequently allowed people to come see her, often as many as 5,000 people. Oh. That's 12 acres of plenty of room. <laughs> <laughs> Beyond this rustic arbor are double double beds lush with pink roses, white lilies, and blue delphinium, uh, all the soft colors of a traditional English old-fashioned cottage garden. And then we have a fruit orchard with borders of white blooms. And now we're going to go back and look and see if we got all the elements of the, of the early gardens. Just to retrace our steps, we started we started here at the house. The picture with the big sweeping views down the hill was from here. That small, oh, shoot, my finger slips. Small intimate garden was here. The evergreens and the cascading waterfall. Ending in the lily ponds, the knot garden, and then you move through the rustic arbor and the delphinium and the lilies and roses, and through uh, some fruit trees and on down, and you're pretty far away from the house by now. We're going to look now at a couple more houses that share the same characteristics, but on a smaller, possibly more manageable scale. Beginning in the 1890s, industrialization had created both wealth, free time, and an explosive interest in gardening. Dayton was no exception. The Haswells lived at the corner of Maysfield and Southview. Uh, this house is highly visible from the street. The same sweeping front yard down to Southwell, Southview. Mr. Haswell was a prominent iron firm executive and associated with both Dayton Malleable Iron and NCR. This is different in that it has the grand scale uh, axial crossways. So right across the front of the house is this big, uh, clearly landscaped walkway divided up geometrically with crosswalks and solid volumes of the flat and clipped hedges contrast with the voluptuous fullness of the flowers beneath. And at the far end of that axial walkway and visible from Southview, sort of, uh, on the far left-hand side of the house as you're looking at the front door, um, is this really charming uh, water feature dipping pool with the blue jars. And it was the jars were supposedly used to water the plants. The roses are painstakingly trained in the French style on uh, an extensive tra trellis. The fountain is still there and visible. Uh, the roses, not so much. And we're going to move over to a neighbor's house. Arthur and Jesse Nevius lived on Rubicon, right where Haber comes in. He was a paper manufacturer, and she was quite the gardener. There's no record of her using a landscape architect. But she did love to have her picture taken in her garden. And we got married, so we love these pictures. So this is Mrs. Nevius. I love it. She's in her garden. She's got her cutting basket in her hand, her skirt, her heels, and her hat. <laughs> I gardened all day yesterday. It's exactly what I look like. <laughs> I love this for the wisteria. You see all that climbing wisteria up the side of the house? 
These are the days before air conditioning. And they, you know, in the spring, you'd have had your windows open and it would have just smelled heavenly. This is, uh, Nebius is there in the pink, right in the middle. Uh, and I love the birdhouse. It's bigger than Mrs. Nebius. <laughs> right in the center of the picture, huge. Lots of ornamental walls in this garden, and you can see an example. It was very common to have some cutout spaces in the walls, so you either had yard art or pictures, things of ornamental or decorative, ornamental or decorative pottery. Um, this is my favorite slide in this whole part of the presentation. I love the blue picture on the far left. I think, just think it jumps out at me. It. Um, Large gardens, and this was a very large garden, um, often built in this in this period often have a wild element, uh, so called because it was supposed to look unplanned and untended, and I, just like today, it's totally untrue. It, it, it's a lot of work to create a garden that looks that wild and that untended and that cool all at the same time. <laughs> Moving on down on Oakwood Avenue, Woody Knoll is the home of Robert and Alice Pryor Patterson. They use Sam Zaring. Uh, he was part of the Patterson family and an executive at NCR and also helped to found, very active book uh, in the community, helped to found the local chapter of the Boy Scouts, the Dayton Rotary, and the Dayton Foundation. But Mrs. Patterson was very busy in the garden. She, there was a formal garden with perennials a rookwood tiled fountain, an enclosed rose garden, and a wildflower garden that went down the ravine behind the house. Alice Patterson loved the color blue. It was her signature color. Her clothes were blue. Her car was blue. Much of her garden was blue. The rookwood pottery jars and fountain tiles were all blue, and there were numerous pots of blue hydrangeas. This, I think, is kind of charming. This, obviously, in the spring, and the beautiful airiness to it. Um, the weeping cherry and the subdued palette of gray, pink, and uh, blue create a restrained look. And we see the Moorish theme of blue glazed tiles, and in this case, rookwood, along with water jars. True. Hers was not a rustic garden, but one hearkening back to Europe with elaborate trellis work. Uh, and a large terrace. They say that the pergola, right there in the middle round, ceiling uh, was as highly polished as a ballroom floor. Moving on to Runnymede. Runnymede was the home of, of the garden, home and gardens of Harold uh, and Catherine Talbot and their nine children. She had five children under six and then had four more. This is Ta Mr. Talbot was an industrialist, like many of the men mentioned today, but it was really Mrs. Talbot who was the real energy and go-getter in this family. <laughs> Mrs. Talbot was a force to be reckoned with, and just for starters, uh, she's credited with founding the Garden Club of Dayton and the Westminster Choir College, which was founded at Westminster Presbyterian Church before it moved to New Jersey. This house, let me see, at the edge of the property, it's that same moving toward a, a much wilder look. Uh, the woodland garden extended about four or 500 feet out from the property, and it's real different in feel from the swimming pool, uh, which was closer to the house, the formal Italianate pool. Here, the stone, we find precisely symmetrical arrangement of two bathing pavilions, lengthy um, columns, uh, and a Moorish style. Unfortunately, the house and the gardens are no longer there. During World War II, the playhouse was used for research in the Manhattan Project and was raised because of radioactive contamination. We think that Catherine Terrace, the street Catherine Terrace, was probably the driveway uh, for this house. And then we moved to her daughter's home, Elsie Talbot, uh, wife of George Mead. Uh, built this house, lived in this house, and they what they did that was unusual was that they hired a different architect. They hired El, uh, Ellen Biddle Shipman, 
And she was one of two or three female landscape architects in the country at this time uh, and did really fabulous work. She was known for her formal gardens and lush planting style. Behind the, ha uh, behind the house, uh, there's an intimate terrace, there was an intimate terrace garden with attractive setting under large trees. Also a swimming pool, horse stables, vegetable and cutting gardens, an orchard with perennial border and a vegetable garden beyond that. I'm thinking there were some other gardeners in there too. <laughs> this is a this is a fun one because I spent 35 years living uh, on Rubicon and did not know this. This is the home of John and Julia Patterson Crane, property designed by the Homestead Brothers. This is on the corner of Sawmill and Rubicon. It is no longer there. Uh, it was torn down and replaced by the Rubicon Mill condominiums. But when it was there, you can see this really formal, classical, balanced house. And then it comes down a big sweeping stairway and into these really deep gardens with um, the entire back was get the house and gardens covered the, the whole block and the back of it then dropped down into these uh, steep steps, sheltered area, towering trees overhead and deep borders of a variety of flowers all around. I have trouble when I drive by Rubicon Mill condominiums picturing this on that property, but you can all try it. And the last home we're going to look at is the home of Robert Dunn Patterson and his wife, Henrietta Lau Patterson. This garden was designed by the Olmsted Brothers. And there is a fabulous interactive website called Olmsted Online that allows you to go back and find the correspondence, handwritten correspondence and working papers between the Olmsteads and all of their clients all over the country. So you do a search on Dayton, you look up private estates and yard or private estates and gardens, and you come up with these fabulous letters back and forth between the clients and the Olmsteads. I found them for the current owner going back to about 1904. This house was built in 1905 or six, if I remember correctly. The Olmsteads had more commissions in Dayton, Ohio, than in any other city west of the Alleghenies at this particular time. I find that to be amazing. Cleveland, Chicago, uh, Pittsburgh, Dayton had far more. And they did, uh, did I already say this, Dayton Country Club, Hills and Dales, uh, golf course, and um, lots of things. They did a bunch of stuff. The coolest and tons of private commissions. So this picture is a picture of their garden in the back a uh, hundred years ago, got all the same elements we've been talking about, the evergreens, paths, fountain, borders. And the current uh, owner has kept a lot of the elements, but redone them to, to be uh, more contemporary in feel. Uh, same space, same features, totally different and an eye toward more sustainable uh, gardening. So as we move toward my friend Mara Besh here in just a minute is gonna tell you about today's trends. What are we looking for? Well, just a few of the characteristics, ecologically or environmentally sound, resilient, pollinator friendly. You ought to know where you are, whether you're in Dayton or Denver, it ought to be pretty clear. And it's best when it's dynamic. Gardening has evolved. Our lives have changed. Most of us don't have the eight gardeners that Mrs. Talbot and Mrs. Wright had. And we see very clearly that we do better when we work with the environment as opposed to against it. So now, here's my fabulous friend, Mara, and she's going to tell you all about what's coming. Wow. I love looking at those gardens because really you do see some pollinator friendly situations. Um, so that's good to, good to see. Okay, so I'm going to focus on native plants and rebuilding habitats. The things that I really think are important are first defining native plants, then going over some of the benefits and importance of native plants, and then focusing on what Doug Tallamy 
um, says that each of us can do to provide more habitat, more diversity for our pollinators. Okay, never mind. All right, definition. Um, I think uh, as I look at this group, I see a lot of people who already are native plant fanatics. So thank you. <laughs> and probably something that you already know, but they are found naturally within our ecosystem or habitat um, without human introduction. Okay, they've evolved over hundreds of years. A great resource is the National Wildlife Federation. And on your PowerPoint handout, I have listed every um, link and reference at the end of, of the PowerPoint. So how many know what, let's see if I can point this, what that is. Oh, Georgie knows better. Don't put me on this card. <laughs> it's a viceroy. It's a viceroy, and it's a fake monarch. And why do you suppose it's a fake monarch? Because monarchs don't get taste good. Yes, monarchs don't taste good. So that's a very smart butterfly. <laughs> All right. Um, our native plants thrive in the local conditions including soil, rain, temperature, and therefore match their growing requirements. Um, they usually require less water and maintenance. I say usually, because we are seeing a shift in climate change. So that's always interesting to see what's going to happen. They offer uh, the most beneficial habitat. They have formed symbiotic relationships with the native wildlife, and I am biased. I think they are beautiful. They also help prevent runoff in your, um, you know, extensive rain. What, what was it at the beginning of April? What did we get? Five inches and kept coming and coming. And we were wondering if spring was ever going to be here. Um, the deep roots of some of these plants help prevent runoff um, and keep the soil from getting compacted. All right, so gardeners work the soil. We add compost and mulch. Um, if you plant a wide diversity, you help. Imagine this, you help sequester carbon in the soil. We like that. Trees sequester a lot of carbon. And so your native plants do too. Different root, root depths um, help to penetrate all parts of the soil and spread the nutrients around. Now, in your handout, I have some native plants. It's not the same one as this, but this is, if you look at this, a common nine bark, which is a native shrub, look at the root depth there. Black-eyed Susans, prairie drop seed, buffalo grass. Look at your turf grass, barely there with root structure. Now, is that gonna prevent runoff? Daylily spirea, <clears throat> excuse me, spirea, not so much. Now the handout that you have, look at this. Now you can see some of these plants go down to 15 feet root depth. That's incredible. Now that helps stabilize your soil. So you have uh, grasses, flowers, um, even shrubs that help stabilize the soil um, enrich the soil, prevent runoff, what's not to like. So Ohio native wildlife has evolved with the native plants in this region. Like um, Georgie was saying, you want to have your gardens look like they belong in Ohio. Now I lived in Alaska and I lived in the high plains of Idaho, the high desert plains, and it doesn't look like this. You want to have your, your garden reflective of where you live and have the right plants in the right place. Look at all of the things that um, use pollinator food. All right, all, you know, honeybees, bumblebees, other bee species, butterflies, moths, wasps, beetles, on and on and on. So all of these creatures need food. 10 things to get you started. You have that, this in your handout, all right? 
Doug Tallamy. Everybody wants to know who is Doug Tallamy. Professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology, um, author of 104 research articles and more publications. Uh, I have all of his books. This is the gospel according to Tallamy. I don't know if you're familiar <laughs> with, with these, but um, you're, please come up and look at them. It's amazing the work that this gentleman has done to the benefit of our environment. First on your list is to shrink the lawn. All right, this was my house when we bought it. Tell me, what's the benefit for the pollinators there? There's no dandelions. <laughs> pollinators like dandelions, don't they? Well, who's feeding on what there? It's just lawn. Now, this is an oak tree. That's good. That's I like that. Um, and there's some walnut trees, but do you see anything else that would feed a pollinator? So we bought this house in uh, 2011, and the story is uh, my son is in Dayton and started having grandchildren, so we had to move from Minnesota. <laughs> and so we bought this. It's a beautiful home, I think, and um, has about eight tenths of an acre. I mean, it's it's close to an acre, but there basically um, was no lawn. Now we want you to shrink the lawn. Does that mean get rid of the lawn? That just means shrink it. Um, start small. Start planting something. And what we found was. In the very front, out here is the road. What happened was a tree had fallen prior to our moving there, and there was this huge dead spot in the front by the road. And it was very difficult to get anything to grow there. So we said, let's get the garden hose. So we got the garden hose and laid out a bed that surrounded all the dead stuff and the weeds and just dug that up and started small. All right. Uh, remove invasive species. They, they, those are ecological tumors. So what's an invasive species? I think you all can give me an example. Honeysuckle, yeah. Uh, how about garlic mustard? I found one of those in my garden yesterday and I was just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so you gotta get it before it uh, goes into the wind. So yeah. And it's really hard to remove your, your invasive species if in the way back, you can look way back here, way back. Those guys don't, they don't remove their invasive species. And um, so I'm constantly monitoring the back for honeysuckle and garlic mustard and um, some of the ivies that uh, crawl up the trees and kill them. Looks like there's a pear tree back there. Pardon me? There's a pear tree back there, it looks like. Uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> probably. All right. So we want to remove invasive species. All right. So, voila. Do you see what's back here? There's a house. That's my house. I removed my invasive species. This is out on the road in the front garden. That's that area that was dead, where the dead tree was. So what you see here, okay, um, you see some black-eyed Susans. This is not the best picture, but gray-headed coneflowers. Um, you see a mix. You see a mix of things. Um, what you're striving for is to get a, a diversity and draw in the pollinators. And this is a better picture. Well, it'll, I guess it's coming up. Um, what you have also in your hands handout is Doug Tallamy wants you to plant keystone genera. Those are the backbone plants of the ecosystem. So in the back of the, one of the handouts, you have a list of those from the National Wildlife Federation. Now, the keystone genera are very important because certain pollinators um, bees, butterflies can only survive on certain plants. So you could plant a butterfly bush throughout your yard, but are you going to get caterpillars from a butterfly bush? 
you are not going to get caterpillars from a butterfly bush. Why? Not a host plant. Exactly. Thank you. You need milkweed. You need milkweed in order to um, host the caterpillars um, that, and, the, and the eggs for the monarch butterfly. It's very specific. And there are bees, there are all kinds of uh, very specialized insects that need these, these uh, keystone plants. And so without keystone plants, the food web falls apart, period. One of the best keystone plants you can put in your yard is an oak tree. All right, this is what happened. I was, I was pulling away the weeds and I go, whoop. I literally almost tripped over this, this beautiful little fawn there. Um, oh, well, uh, keystone trees provide uh, sources of shelter and food, oaks, support 557 Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, 557. Wow. Come on guys, that's a yeah. lot. Um, another thing that Doug Tallamy talks about, and you think about this, think about the common chickadee, okay? How many caterpillars in the spring does it take to raise a batch of chickadees? How many? Guesses? Yeah. 6,000 average a day no. to raise a batch. Oh, okay. So you may not know this, but early in the spring, there are caterpillars on your trees and the chickadees have to um, find them. So if you don't have any trees, you're not going to be able to um, help those chickadees out. It's, it's important that you have some of these keystone plants. All right, be generous with your plantings, increase abundance and diversity. Okay, so here we see a few more. You see purple cone flower. Um, this is uh, Heliopsis back there, prairie drop seed. That's a fun understory point, very fun um, grass. Green headed cone flower, Liatris, switch grass, all of those are native plants. But I also have some non natives in there because I like color different color, the, that's moonbeam coriasis there, and there's a bloom flower in there. Um, the bee balm is a cultivar. That's another thing we need to just kind of branch off on cultivars and native, native bars. Those are different terms. Uh, Doug Tellamy says, and again, the gospel according to Doug Tellamy is to strive for at least 70% of true native. And why is that? Why wouldn't you want to trust all of the cultivars and nativars that are out there? Yes, sir. Because the cultivars are bred from flowers, not nectar. And there's a difference, yeah. I mean, some of them may provide nectar, but you don't know the quality of the nectar that you're getting or the quality of the pollen that you're getting. And there is research out there, and they, they do, you know, plant-to-plant -plant research where they... Um, actually have a cultivar and then a native and then they count the number of bees on them, things like that. Um, but you, true natives are the best for, for um, habitat. Again, um, now again, this is uh, more native plants, prairie dock, um, and that's a compass plant up on the left. How many feet does that root system go down? 15 feet. Even in my clay, crummy soil, <laughs> maybe only 10 that soil. Um, but look at in the front. What do I have there? What are those? Those are some zinnias. Now, why do I have zinnias if I'm such a native plant person? Because color like pink and red will bring hummingbirds. This is the butterfly buffet. You really want to attract butterflies or exactly bees, pollinators. And for a monarch waste station, which my garden is, um, you want to have some annuals in there. So I just chose some zinnias to put in there. And yeah, lovely color. And I also see um, butterflies on them. So yeah. again, um, I, I like to 
choose a wide variety of colors. This is a little different structure from what Georgie was doing. <laughs> yeah, I'm more of the wild uh, side of gardening. So um, this is an important slide. I love this picture. My friend Eric Stavali took this. That's a bee butt. <laughs> uh, reduce your night nighttime pol light pollution. Why? Well, there's one of the answers up there. Have you ever looked at your lamps? at night and you see all the dead bugs in them moths pollinate at night all right so you're killing your moth you're killing a lot of your nighttime insects your fireflies things like that so please um think about that reduce nighttime light pollution uh we put up motion lights so if, you know if we're a little nervous about who's in who's coming around the house the motion light will come on otherwise it's pretty dark all right, network with neighbors, get on the homegrown national park map. That's Doug Tallamy's website. And um, I've done that. I've also done National Wildlife uh, Federation certification habitat. Um, there's all kinds of things you can do with Monarch Way Station. For instance, it's just going to be a big sign on my yard. And I did it, I did it all. <laughs> Oops. Number seven, conservation hardscape. Keep the height of your mower up a little bit. Cover your window wells. I have found uh, frogs in my window wells and I didn't look like they could get out. So um, try to do that and keep the creatures that you do get, keep them healthy. This is important too, and I never really thought about this. Uh, Underneath your trees, especially like your oak tree, we finally um, put one in this year. All those wonderful caterpillars and things that are coming down to be fed, um, so the robins can feed the chickadees and things. Well, you're just gonna chop them up with your mower. Build a concert, build a um, pupation site underneath the tree. And you can see I haven't done it under the walnut yet, but back over here, we did it under our oak tree. Um, so you can put ground cover there. And when the caterpillars come down, they have a place to land. And you don't chew them up with your lawnmower. It just doesn't make sense. So I'm doing all this good work. And there you go with the weed whacker and the lawnmower because we like tidy lawns. Woo. What do you think about this slide? All right, first of all, you don't need fertilizers for native plants. You just don't. If you fertilize your native plants, they're going to go really lanky and they're going to flop. So that's that's a benefit. You don't have to waste your money on fertilizers. Pesticides. Please avoid pesticides. Now, I was talking with someone here about um, um, that some of the neighbors that use the mosquito stuff. I've already had a neighbor in April have a, um, I don't want to say the name, but anyway, came and sprayed for mosquitoes and they're kind of kitty cornered from my yard and they just go, oh, um, because that, that's going to defeat the purpose of um, some of the things that you're striving for. And if you're using pesticides on your lawn, that's going to defeat the purpose of what you're striving for. So please, if you, if you need to use um, a pesticide of some sort, keep it very minimal um, or spot. You know, if, if you've got that lesser celandine invasive stuff, maybe paint it instead of spray it. Does that make sense? Good, good. So you just, you don't need fertilizer and um, probably don't need a whole lot of pesticides, especially with native plants. You should need fewer because they are native to the region. Ooh, this is my garden, all of these. Um, this was, came out and saw that and I thought, okay, it won't be long and moments later, there was my monarch. Yeah, that was really sweet and precious to see. And then I was trying to get it to open its wings up so I could see, you can tell if it's male or female. 
And um, I think that's a female because the males usually have two spots. But anyway, as soon as I got up close, I took off. <laughs> Smart butterfly. But anyway, zoning rules. Why should you um, think about zoning rules in your neighborhood? People might be a little bit upset if you're changing uh, the look of the neighborhood and planting uh, some of the native plants and grasses because I've had some friends that's uh, not, that didn't happen to me. Luckily, my neighbors have been pretty accepting. In fact, some have even joined in. But I have had friends that say, that have called the um, zoning people and say, gee whiz, your grass is taller than eight inches, so you better get mowing it. So please check your zoning ordinances before you move up. And, and you know, talk to your neighbors too. Um, that's all important. All right. Tips for beginnings, start small, add to your garden each year. I've got a flyer up here that has some really easy steps. Um, if you're interested, plant true natives and rather than hybrids and cultivars, we talked a little bit about that. Strive for 70% true natives. It doesn't have to be all or nothing, okay? You don't have to take out your whole lawn. Um, and I don't think people want to do that because you know, I got to have room for a volleyball net for um, my grand girls. Uh, I've got to play croquet, um, all kinds of things that um, I do outside. <laughs> my nine-year-old is um, a tumbler, and so she's got to have space to run and do hamstrings and things that I could never do now. <laughs> Used to be able to, but not anymore. All right, this is my pride and joy in Red Wing. Um, wow. I had an acre, and this is a bluff in the background, Red Wing Bluff. Uh, it's the tightest bend. We've overlooked the Mississippi River. It was heaven. You see the rutabecchia, um, doe pie, um, and then I put in some canna bulbs, and then I have Russian sage and a lot of native grasses. Uh, it, it just was a riveting morning with the sun coming up, and that was... I had to leave that behind, but I gladly did to um, be with my family. And so all of those plants are in there. Those are native plants. Now, somebody please tell me that that isn't okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, native plants are stunning. They are just stunning. And the, my gardening style is totally different from a lot of other people, but I also feel um, the way that I am trying to benefit habitat and nature, it's it's worth it. So that's all I have. If you have questions, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, we back a couple pages. You were talking about brown cover. Um, yeah. We have in our front yard grass that is dying out uh, because of two or three shade trees that we have there. What would be suitable brown cover uh, for that area? And one of them is on a downward slope. Downward slope ground cover in shade. There are many uh, native ground covers that I guess what it would depend on is your soil type. And um, there, my favorite ground cover is wild ginger. It's just beautiful. Yeah, Do you have more it? Of it. Oh, yeah. more of it. Here's a question for you. Do you have the witch hazel? No, I don't. You need to get one. I do. I've got 365 days of bloom in my yard. I'm not talking winter with snow, without snow. He also does the Wayerson um, witch hazel collection. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. If you haven't been to Wayerson during um, February and March um, and in the fall, in, uh, for the fall colors, witch hazels are in bloom in February and March primarily. There's a few varieties though that bloom in January. I've got one witch hazel that's in bloom a week before Thanksgiving, has a red fragrant bloom, blooms all the way through Christmas, December, January, and sometimes blooms all the way into March. Oh, and, and um, 
Occasionally, I do tours at Wegerson. We have 120 different cultivars of witch hazel, probably the largest collection in the United States of witch hazels. Thank you. Um, oh, that, that's Russian sage. Is it Russian? Yeah. Now, I need to clarify the slides that I did show were just of my front yard. I've got beds around the entire backyard and what's on the side and stuff but i didn't have good enough pictures for to show you all of that and put you to sleep anyway but uh, more questions question from zoom oh hi zoom question is there a way to receive or pick up the handout oh that um the library yes that's a library question um uh, I guess the answer is yes. I okay. just don't know how. Uh, so I'll just talk to you, Chris. Yeah, I, I I'll, I'll put it on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, she has a copy of the PowerPoint, so she can put that on. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I we have a handout up here about native plants for this area, and we also the poster that Mara is going to point to right now, right there. Oh, advertises our uh, garden tour coming up, <laughs> coming up on June 10th. And uh, five gardens, <laughs> five or six gardens uh, in Oakwood and Kettering, they're perfectly beautiful and fill a whole variety of different kinds of things. So the tickets went on sale yesterday. We sold 53 yesterday. I was pretty excited about that. So you be the next. Other questions for Mark? Anyway, sorry that I've got you oak trees from the Oakwood Johnny Apple Seed Program, and you were talking about the ground cover of wild ginger. So, is that something you go and buy in the nursery where you get wild ginger? Let me repeat the question for Zoom. Um, she's very excited about two oak trees that she got from the I forget where Johnny yeah. Apple Seed Program, and she's asking if uh, where she gets native ginger. Uh -huh. Wild ginger. I have a handout up here, up here, and also in in the references there are um, links to native nurseries. Uh, I get mine bare root, and you can plant them in the spring. They are um, mailed to me. Well, in fact, some are coming soon uh, next week. You can buy bare root ginger, or um, I'm sure you can buy the plant somewhere. Um, I know um, there some of the nurseries do offer native plants, and so you could check the the uh, local nurseries and native plant nurseries for that. Uh, yes, there's also the native plant sales this spring coming up. Oh, oh that's yeah. right. There, oh, the Street Street market. market. Oh, yeah, having theirs, and then meat, uh, meat bourbon will be having theirs too. Yeah, three yeah. coming up the native plant sales. So say also that you go to Ohio to the website, right? On your button that you have, for those of you um, that got buttons, there's a link there. You can go there, and that gives you all kinds of information about native plants and the miracle of nature. And for those of you that aren't aware, you should know that um, Native, Ohio Native Plant Month, which now has extended to be U.S. Native Plant Month, uh, was started by Hope Taft. Question, yes, ma'am. No, comment. Oh, yes. Um, we are members of the Miami Valley Hosta Society. If you have not joined, it's only 12 bucks for, I think, a couple. Um, but we are also, um, our group is part of the Hosta College that meets uh, in April. And they cover everything from native plants to pollinators to hostas to ponds. Um, evergreens. So if you're looking for something fun to do while it's still cold and snowy outside, consider joining the Hosta Society and um, you'll get more information about the next upcoming Hosta College. Question from Zoom. Yes, Zoom. Question and comment. I think it's to you. Uh -oh. Your garden is absolutely beautiful. I know it takes time, but to manage my expectations, how long did it take you to get to this point? 
Good question. Excellent. I started small. We started small in 2012. We added on each year. It is now what, 2023? And we're still changing. We're still adding and changing. I'm decreasing the lawn. So it's something that I do over time. And I've told everyone, it's my therapy. They look at the garden and they go, you really need therapy. <laughs> You know, what's more relaxing than being out there? Um, if you just stop for a while and just listen to the noise around those native plants, um, that's my therapy. So it does, realistically, it takes it takes a long time, but start small. You've got to start somewhere. The biggest gift that you can give the environment is something simple. Plant an oak tree. Plant an oak tree. Okay. Another thing that I just wanted to tell you real quickly, because I'm from Minnesota, um, I was traveling home and we were going up the Interstate 35 from Texas through Iowa da, 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 all the way up. They have designated that as a monarch corridor. So there are signs all the way out there. It's a monarch corridor. They're trying to plant milkweed and help save our monarchs. So we need to do stuff like that to get, get involved, um, um, make sure that uh, we, we are heard in the native arena. That's it? Yay. Yeah. Yeah.